get started, um, I want to welcome you all to our talk and uh, to the winter conference as well. Um, so you are here with uh, John Duke and I. Um, and before we get, I want to get started here with a few slides before we start our talk. Um, so we are presenting this conference on land that has been inhabited by the Nipmuc people prior to European colonization. Um, uh, it's important that you actually look at this map and find yourself where you are uh, occupying this land uh, and acknowledge this. Uh, other work that we're doing, and we uh, strongly recommend participants actually uh, participate in our BIPOC uh, and white ally caucus groups that are happening today uh, from one to two o'clock. And uh, also take a moment to look at these organizations um, that are doing uh, BIPOC led uh, work as well. Here are some of our sponsors. Uh, without these sponsors, this work wouldn't be uh, possible. Uh, another thing too that I want to bring up is our uh, auction. Uh, there's really, really good material here. Uh, please visit our auction. We do have some uh, QR codes to scan and I will try to put some of those in our link for the uh, folks that are online. And NOFA bulk order. Um, is open, which doesn't really, isn't conference specific, but uh, the bulk order for anybody that's interested in doing uh, bulk order purchases. <clears throat> and our soil health table is up on the third floor of the student center. So if you want to go in and meet some of our soil techs, um, and maybe we got a couple microscopes set up. Um, Ruben and I, unfortunately, are sort of running all over the place. So we're not necessarily parked in there, but we're going to try to get in there as much as we can. Um, but check out the soil health table up on the third floor as well. Right. And the survey at the end. Yeah, which you already got. All right. So, Ruben, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Uh, <laughs> so, I probably need to unmute this thing here. Uh, so, Ruben Perella, he him pronouns. I uh, live about 40 minutes up north from here, uh, also Nipmuc territory. Uh, I am the soil technical coordinator for Norfolk, Massachusetts, um, essentially going around uh, different farms, homesteads, gardens, uh, whoever's interested in doing this type of work, we will come visit, um, do assessments, whether those are uh, physical assessments, biological assessments, or chemical assessments as well. Um, we work mostly on grant related work, uh, which uh, is most of the time led by interest and Hopefully we can get some of that interest from you as well here uh, on this talk as well. Go ahead. Do you work only in mass or do you work in neighboring states? Or... We do work in neighboring states. However, we do have other uh, chapters for NOFA mass. Um, or NOFA in general. And NOFA, yeah. Right. So, so they, so if you are, if you do have a specific need, we can speak about that individually too. So some NOFAs don't necessarily have all the technical aspects, some do, like NOFA Connecticut actually has a pretty decent soil tech and microscopy, but like NOFA Rhode Island, not so much. Um, but, you know, they have the ability to reach out to us and, and you know, cross-pollinate. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so, and uh, just a little bit about what the work that we've been doing. Um, some of the work that we've been doing uh, around microscopy. So I took the Dr. Lane Soil Food Web School um, uh, online course, and I'm a certified uh, lab tech, tech, if you will. Um, and so that's the type of work that we've actually been uh, providing as a service through NELFA Mass as well. Um, and uh, a little bit about my background, I uh, studied environmental design in the University of Puerto Rico. Um, but most of the work that I did in my professional career was in the laboratory business, all the way from uh, bench scale uh, stuff to the more boring management stuff. Um, and I'm finally now getting to the work that I really have passion for, which is in the ag sector. Um, so, and now I'm here. <laughs> I'm John Duke, I'm a NOFA board member. Um, <clears throat> I uh, sort of stumbled into this whole microscopy piece about uh, maybe six years ago in composting. Um, 
and just the role of biology in our soils and what it means. Um, so I've kind of gotten into that wormhole pretty deeply. And uh, with NOFA now, uh, to uh, some of the folks here in the room point that we were talking before the whole thing started, uh, this uh, microscopy training piece is is become sort of my main focus going forward. Um, I do. So that gets into this 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 conversation uh, that we put together here today. It's very informal, <laughs> um, and um, the goal was really to present different viewpoints of how anybody can be using a microscope in an ag situation. Um, we interviewed different people uh, to, to get this information. Um, some of it we're not familiar with. Uh, you know, it's outside of our area of interest, but I think it's important tidbits because farmers generally wear a lot of different hats. And um, there's a lot of area that we can develop with this. Um, and uh, the other really important part that I wanted to get today is feedback, you know, from everybody out in Zoom land and uh, in the room, you know, what can we do going forward to help get, you know, microscopes on farms um, and training and, you know, maybe we can subsidize microscopes. Um, but to uh, push that a little bit, um, we just wanted to present, um, you know, different aspects that you could be using it. Um, so as we we're talking today, uh, some of it is just information that we got from interviews and we've got no practical experience, um, but they're still, uh, you know, meaningful, meaningful pieces. Um, toward the end of the talk, we're going to get into the things that Ruben and I do a lot of with, which are definitely soil related, um, very applicable, and I think both of us have uh, enough working knowledge to get ourselves in a lot of trouble. Um, <laughs> um, so that's it. So I don't know if you want to start off with the meat and potatoes. Yeah, sure. Yep. So uh, as John mentioned, we're actually going to be um, we're going to be going over some of the aspects of uh, microscopy in general and go over a few of these um, of these aspects uh, as to what industries are doing uh, with microscopes, right? Uh, so the first one we wanted to highlight is the uh, cannabis sector. The cannabis sector has been an uh, industry where they have readily and quickly adopted the use of microscopes in many facets. So um, prior to looking at the soil as a soil food web, um, they were already using uh, higher magnification scopes to look at things such as trichomes. And a little bit on that a little later, um, specific on trichomes, we'll talk a little bit about that on, during, during the rise of phase cycle. Um, and uh, they were, they're also using these microscopes for breeding techniques. Uh, plant physiology and a little more plant physiology in a second. And also uh, in breeding as well. So they would also use higher magnification for uh, uh, looking at seeds. And so, uh, so again, these are early adapters of this technology and uh, they're making great use of it already. Um, another aspect uh, that, uh, and and just to quickly go over some of these things, right? So the trichomes that they're looking for in cannabis are looking for uh, specific coloration. They're looking for, because uh, that can potentially give them potency, right? Um, and when to harvest. Uh, for the seeds, it's more about, again, looking at how big is the seed? Is there any imperfection? So this is actually a way to, instead of, it, it, it advances your breeding techniques, right? Um, so that's that's one sector of of uh, the industry, agriculture industry that's using the microscopes already and using them quite efficiently. Um, another uh, another aspect of of this is the uh, another aspect of this are plant physiology. So anybody here can actually take a microscope and this could be actually a low powered microscope and start to uh, look at plants in a way where you can actually look at uh, certain diseases, whether those are fungal, whether those are bacterial. Uh, viruses, you can't tell uh, the virus itself, but you can tell whether or not your plant is being attacked by a virus. 
So in, in terms of uh, uh, diagnosing your plant, this is another method that can be used uh, or a tool that could be used for the diagnosis of, of, your, uh, of your plant. Um, so again, these are pathogens and diseases that you can actually identify. Uh, uh, let's see, so, I figured you took like plant biology. All the things you do is okay. <laughs> Um, and another thing about the uh, plant pathology is uh, that's, that you can actually currently do right now, um, anybody with a microscope with minimal training, um, is the identification of nematodes. So there are beneficial nematodes, there are also uh, detrimental nematodes. Um, they're easily, uh, they can be easily identified uh, with just a few morphological um, characteristics. Uh, typically, you just look at the mouth parts of those nematodes, and you can tell whether it's a predatory, fungal, or a bacterial feeder, um, which are the three major morphological groups that you're, be, you're going to be looking at. Um, and uh, sorry, and then the detrimental being the root feeder. Uh, those are the ones that you don't want in your field, right? Um, or if you, you, I guess, you know, you want to say you don't want them, you want to see low numbers of those. You just want to see a diversity, right? Um, and not just something dominated by a particular microorganism. Um, so that's one way that you can use that for. Uh, another thing is necrosis on leaves, uh, galls that could be, uh, kind of appear on some of these uh, on the surface of the, uh, of the plant. Um, so in general, a, a diagnosis, right? You can use the, the microscope as a tool for diagnosing disease and, and, and issues. Um, and next we have uh, pest management. Yeah, so I'll speak real quick on uh, pest management, particularly in the plant world. Um, uh, I spoke with a, an IPM manager and <clears throat> they use a slightly different microscope. It's what they call a dissection microscope. Um, which is not what Ruben and I use, but I think it still is a as a is a tool that is pretty useful. Um, it's a little bit broader, and as far as larger uh, organisms, particularly insects, aphid, um, you know, a lot of what we kind of view as regular plant pests. Um, uh, uh, an IPM manager would really be trying to speciate those to then target um, particular um, parasitic uh, insects to go after that species. And those relationships are pretty tightly knit. So when you're looking at aphids, there's a lot of different kinds of aphids. They like to know which aphid they're working with and then find a predatory insect that specifies that particular one. Speciating things is really kind of difficult. And as far as us layman folk, um, that takes you know years of, of information. Um, but as Ruben pointed out to me the other day when we were talking about this, <clears throat> I think in the very near future, we might have some artificial intelligence <coughs> that we could probably take a picture of something and that whole mundane piece of speciating that takes 10 years to learn, you might get that in a nanosecond on your computer if somebody a lot smarter than me builds that database and allows the people that are doing the work to do that. And now I've got a pretty powerful tool and I can get a particular parasitic wasp to go after that in a you know, relatively short time frame. I think the reality of that happening is pretty high. Um, soon too, right? And pretty soon too. So, you know, yeah, uh, you might have spent 10 years to become a insect specialist or somebody's gonna come up with software and make that whole thing happen. And it becomes really meaningful to people that have boots on the ground. Where do um, you shop for a parasitic wasp? Uh, they're actually, well, uh, and that's, yeah, okay. You can either shop for them or maybe you can cultivate them yourself. <laughs> Um, you have to start with something. You got to start with something. And having a microscope is going to let you see what you're really working with. I just uh, wanted to make sure that people online can hear that question. 
the question was, where can you actually uh, shop for these particular organisms, right? The particular uh, bi biological control, right? Um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And everybody in Zoom land, how are you hearing everything fine? Just a little check-in. Sounds good to me. All right, thanks. thank you much. I can't really hear the questions from the audience, so thanks for repeating it. Thank you. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about animal pest management? Because you did speak with the vet. Yes, yes. Um, so another uh, I, uh, another interviewee that we had was a veterinarian. Um, and I was asking, you know, how do you use your microscope? How would you use a microscope? And so uh, one of the ways that this veterinarian was actually using her microscope was to look at uh, biological loads, meaning um, they would look at feces, uh, they would look at, uh, at a patty, they would look at these things in the field, uh, collect a sample, and look at the amount of biomass present in, in these. And in terms of, um, do I have a specific uh, bacteria in here? And what is the biomass of the bacteria? Is this bacteria dominating this? So for example, if you had a, um, a set of uh, spirochetes, let's say, or vibrio, you know, how many of those can you have? And then that could be used as a proxy to understand your animal's health. Uh, so this is one way that, um, uh, you know, either through pasture management and things like this, you can actually use. Uh, another important feature of this is uh, these are, when we look at, uh, at, at uh, regenerative agriculture, when we're looking at uh, pasture management, uh, this could be integrated into this whole pasture management because if you know that your animal is sick or you know what's what contains, you know, what's in this patty, um, because we're, we're under the assumption that, okay, well, these animals are grazing and they're, you know, they're pooping, they're, they're, they're uh, fertilizing the ground, but are they actually causing some detriment to the microorganism? Are they bringing in the bright organisms that we need to regenerate the soil, to fertilize the soil? So this is one way to actually uh, look at these patties and uh, make those determinations. And determine nutrient uptake. If, if there's a lack of diversity in the feces of microbes, then um, your animal probably isn't getting the appropriate nutrition. Same with humans. If our gut microbiome isn't that diverse, then we're probably not uh, getting the nutrient uptake from the fruits that we're eating. Um, seed analysis? Yeah, so uh, with seed analysis, we briefly talked about that a little earlier on um, how to um, evaluate uh, seeds either through the shape, size, and color. Uh, that's something that could be used uh, uh, this is something that you can use a microscope to determine these characteristics. Um, and uh, typically what you do with those is you take, you do these by batches. You don't take every single seed and you do this, uh, but you do this by batch. Um, and this is another way to actually accelerate that um, reading process. So if you're saving seeds, um, if you're a reader, uh, these are techniques that you can actually be utilizing to uh, further advance um, uh, that that knowledge that you need to uh, get get what you want from these plants, right? I think a dissecting microscope. I mean, that you can probably do with a dissecting microscope. You can definitely well. do that with a dissecting microscope. Yeah. Um, and newer technology now, they're actually instead of using, um, uh, we're using more cameras uh, and high powered uh, cameras to do the work because they have a different um, field of view. Um, they put less strain on your eyes as well. Uh, when you're looking through a microscope for a, pretty, a long time, uh, for a long amount of time, that puts an enormous strain on your eyes. Um, it's really fun. You can get lost in the microcosm, and sometimes you can end up hours on the scope, and it puts tremendous strain on your eyes. Uh, also, ergonomically speaking, it's not good to be punching over as well. So, uh, people in this, in particular in this industry, are moving more towards. Uh, Digital uh, magnification for cameras uh, for uh, for that particular uh, assessment. I actually have started using cameras as well instead of looking through the lens. I sometimes do the lens um, to switch over for a different field of view uh, because the camera is not as good as uh, the eyepieces. 
Uh, but when you're scanning, um, I typically go for PI pieces uh, in, in that in that case. Good on food safety. Um, similarly, here for uh, another aspect of this too, where where you know people are growing food, so they're producing food, um, and another aspect that's used food safety, right? Um, this has been used for many many years. Uh, on top of doing cultures, uh, meaning uh, taking swabs and, and and plating your your swabs onto a plate which has a specific growing media to look at specific uh, organisms. Another way to do this is also a microscope. Um, you can there are techniques such as staining. There's a thing called gram staining where you can detect specific organisms, whether they're a gram positive or gram negative bacteria. Uh, you can use a specific stain to actually identify those as well. Um, so that and food safety have been used for a very, very long time. But again, it's another tool that's used for um, in, 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 in the industry. <laughs> So now we can talk a little bit about what Ruben and I are a lot more familiar with, which is assessing soils and composts and doing biological assessments. Um, um, what, uh, first of all, with if you're, well, if you're uh, looking at your soils, um, knowing what's going on with them biologically is, uh, in my opinion, a, a pretty powerful tool. Can I interrupt you for a second, yeah. actually? Uh, just quick show of hands here, actually. Who has a microscope here? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Actually, in the poll, there was quite a few. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So just, yeah, just wanted to see if, uh, and, and also we want to, as you can see, we don't have any slides here. We want this to be as dyna dynamic as we can. So, uh, and we're a relatively small group. So if you guys yeah. have any questions, please interrupt us and we'll go from there. Go ahead. And the same with you folks out in Zoom land. Just holler if you got a question. <laughs> um, I have a question. <clears throat> if I, I live in a small community that uh, we don't have schools or universities or anything like that for availability of access to microscopes. Is there a way that you can get your municipality to have a, a, a microbiology resource for the community? The library. I know yes. the library. library. They donate uh, most of them very expensive. So the question uh, for those on Zoom, the question was, um, can uh, microscope access, can uh, municipalities or governmental bodies assist with access to microscopes, right? Is that the right. question? Or schools or, you know, libraries. And sure. Yeah. I think, yes, there's a lot of different ways to do that. I also feel that that's one of the things that Ruben and I certainly have been discussing as far as NOFA Mass's involvement with that. Um, and uh, there's, a, I think there's many different avenues that we could take. Um, one of the things um, I'm particularly interested in is uh, donating microscopes. NOFAMAS is a nonprofit. We could, uh, you know, go online, find people that are selling their microscopes, offer a tax deductible contribution, particularly if it's a microscope that we feel is um, valuable um, and useful. Um, so, you know, Ruben and I could assess that, determine this microscope is actually, you know, very useful to somebody. They might donate it to NOFA Mass. They get their tax deductible contribution. We then get that serviced. And now we pull together these refurbished um, microscopes and actually get them to the people. I, I think having a, a place to go to use a microscope can be beneficial, particularly if that's a really expensive microscope and like a tool that's outside of what most people can afford to get maybe some specific details, but I think it's more valuable to have the microscope on the farm. You know, to, right. it doesn't have to be, I mean, it can be a $300, $500 microscope today. And that's what's really exciting. So much of the stuff, the prices have come down 
and it's they're pretty meaningful tools um and you can get the camera and our computers today are you know quite helpful with a lot of this and with a little bit of training and then a lot of individual time looking at these things i think as a community uh, you know we can all learn a lot um as long as we're humble <laughs> and uh and and communicate um and then possibly yeah that fifty thousand dollar microscope that somebody like dr james white uses to assess how much you know bacteria is getting within a root system you know yeah let's have a microscope library for something like that if if we're really you know getting to a place where we we need that um uh but you know, having uh, we actually did a, a workshop at, at one of the vocational schools, and they had a bunch of student uh, microscopes. You know, so collaborating with a vocational program that has a, a plant program and has a bunch of student microscopes. Um, you know, those spaces I, I think are, are, are pretty intriguing. Um, going back to a little bit more, I, and maybe, well, how are people using their microscopes? Seeing as we got about fifty percent of the population in here that had microscopes. Um, you want to go around real quick and just uh, say how you're using it? I, I have access to a microscope at the school, but I don't actually currently use it down in the garden area. Okay. So I would, um, I was sort of hoping to see how to do that. Okay. Today. So yep. we can address that. Or yep. Absolutely. Yep. I highly recommend that you also go up to our. I'm going to. I'm yes. excited about that. Yes, we have. <laughs> Third floor. Third floor. Yes. Student center. Yeah. I was given, I think it's a dissecting microscope. Yeah. Um, as part of a project called uh, strawberry flower mapping, where apparently you can look at the you can look at the strawberry like meristem and see whether it's vegetative or reproductive. Nice. And that's when you apply nitrogen. It's like at a certain stage you can tell. And so well, I was given this microscope the project. Was supposed to train us how to do it and to do a very good job, but actually, it only played with this microscope and only okay. to know what I can do. <laughs> very cool. Anybody else want to share? All right, then let's get into a little bit more of what Ruben and I do as far as biological assessments. We'll go over that real quick and then we can get back to how we're going to save the world with microscopes. Yeah. <laughs> um, both of us have gone through the soil food web training, which is very microscope specific with the intent of basically repopulating your soil's microbiome um, by developing specifically compost that has that diversity of what um, Dr. Ingham would say are beneficial microbes. Um, so the process is really using a microscope, looking at the soil that we're working with, determining what's the biomass of that soil, which from the soil food web perspective is active organisms. And um, there's active organisms and then there's inactive organisms. Um, sorry. Um, so with the microscope, you're looking at what's actually active and functioning at that point in time. And with that assessment, then we would look for amendments, biological amendments that we could bring to these growing spaces to fulfill the voids in that soil food web um, that are lacking. In turn, that then should pick up the functionality of that soil because it is these microbes that are making the mineral component plant available. Uh, can I interrupt? Absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, in terms of sampling, uh, so you get in the process of doing this, is it static versus dynamic? I mean, are you going for benchmarking when you do this or? Because the, the growing season doesn't stay the same, and you know the diversity of that issue of uh, where you are, when, you know, site specific versus place, that kind of thing. How how does that complicate? My answer to that was that it, yes, it does complicate things because it, it's all, especially when you're looking at active organisms, it's very dynamic. 
And what I'm looking at today might be very different than what I look at tomorrow. And to your point with the seasonality, um, there's that aspect. And it's also why it's important for a farmer to have a microscope. Because if you have that as a tool on your farm and you do this regularly, you're going to now have an awareness of your soil's microbiome through those different seasons. And now you have a means to actually monitor this. We might not know exactly what's going on and we might never know exactly what's going on, but we do know there's a group of organisms that are beneficial. And if we have a way and even if it's you know one time a season, I mean even in the winter you can see activity and it's important activity. Um, but the fact that we're doing it, looking on a semi-regular basis, establishing benchmarks, maybe even just in our mind, but it, um, but now at least you're in tune with what's going on. Is this population growing? Is it not? And as a grower, I mean you need to make those choices. Uh, about functionality and what does it mean? And I think a lot of this is an innate in intelligence. Um, you know, you might be doing something and looking for a plant response, and now you've got this correlation because you can actually see microbes. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, that's going to be beneficial. To what extent is a crop specific? specific? It can be. Uh, before we get to that question, Ruben, do you also have any input to Don's question? So, so uh, just uh, just to add to that, um, it's important to understand that every single lab procedure, field protocol will have a bias, uh, whether that's a microscope, whether that you're sending your samples out to a lab, everything will have a bias. And so it's important to actually have that standpoint. And whenever you're collecting any sample, whether that's for microbial analysis, whether that's for chemistry, it's important to understand what you're trying to achieve, right? So uh, what's your intent with that? Are you looking to understand your fungal bacteria ratio? Are you looking to understand seasonal uh, differences? So it's important to actually, when you're collecting a sample that you have that intent in mind so that you can actually go in and say, okay, I'm collecting these data because I want to track change over time and see uh, is there any seasonality changes or uh, do I have specific populations with a specific plan uh, and things like that. So it's important to actually have that in mind before you collect any samples for anything that you're doing. Uh, one example that I like to use on that is we use this uh, instrument called the penetrometer. The penetrometer, uh, we go to the field and that measures for harvest. So you're looking at pounds per square inch and looking for compaction. So now this instrument is really good, but it's highly biased towards soil moisture. So if it rained up a ton, this instrument is going to tell me like, oh, I have no compaction. I can put this through with no issue. And so having that intention saying, okay, well, I'm going to take this instrument and to John's point, I'm going to take this instrument and use it in the spring. I'm going to use it in the summer. I'm going to use it in the fall. And that way I'm gonna get a better understanding of a better context of my soil. Of, okay, well, after it rains, I notice that this is my PSI. Uh, before in the drought, this is my PSI. In the spring, I notice this is my PSI. So when you're doing comparisons, um, you're not gonna go ahead and compare your spring to your fall. You're gonna go ahead and compare your spring to your spring. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. And going back to the question in the back, as far as like plant uh, specific, um, I, uh, if I'm answering your question correctly, there is what you would learn through the Soil Food Web School is that there are there's basically a, a succession, um, and to be very sort of vague and broad um, terms, what they do is they correlate that with the fungal to bacteria ratio. Which a fungal to bacteria ratio is when you actually do this bioassay, you determine how many of these organisms are fungal how many of these organisms are bacterial, and you make a ratio of that. Most of our soils are bacterially dominated. What Dr. Ingham has then done is she's taken this spectrum of entirely bacterially dominated and entirely fungally dominated and actually correlated what types of plants prefer what type of ratio. 
most of our ag land, so from that viewpoint, you can then say that most of our ag land is um, struggling with weed pressure because it's bacterially dominated. So one of the things that you can do if you've got weed pressure instead of you know, using glyphosate, we could increase the fungal component in the soil, change that soil microbiome to a point that plants aren't happy because they don't have the biological partners anymore to mineralize the soil component. And that's the key there is like, and this is where these microbes, the, the real, the driving force with all this is the microbes are your workers. They're in the soil trying to mineralize the parent material and they're exchanging it with the plant because the plant has the ability to make sugar. And when that relationship is functioning at a high level, the plant is actually gonna put 30% of the sugar that it makes, which is its food. So it's giving away 30%, maybe more, of the food that required a whole lot of energy to make. It's gonna give that away to the soil microbiome because it knows that that soil microbiome is providing the mineral component that the plant needs in order to photosynthesize. So when you turn that force on and have a diversity of microbes, uh, you're gonna have a diversity of minerals that now are available to the plant. And if we you know, bring out a fungal component and maybe you know, foster that environment for the fungal organisms to develop, you can now push that fungal to bacteria ratio up from the spectrum that I'm talking about is basically bare soil to old growth forest. You know, fungal to bacteria ratio of uh, all bacteria, and then maybe not all fungal in the wood in the in the old growth, but certainly fungally dominated. Um, the sweet spot that you know most farmers want to be in or growers want to be in is around a one to one. Um, which most of our soils aren't even close to that. They're still bacterially dominant. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I was just curious about if there's specific microbes that are harmful for a particular crop that you're worried about. Which harmful? Are, yeah, for ones that are harmful and ones that are also beneficial. Um, but just another related question, who hosts the soil food web uh, training? Soil Food Web School. Yeah. Soil Food Web School. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Ingham has a Soil Food Web School. It's an on online platform. She's got foundations courses. She can teach you to be a lab clinician, use the microscope, and then become a consultant as well. Um, those are all for a fee. Um, comes along with certifications, certain requirements to meet all that. And then uh, the foundation courses alone are you can learn a lot. And then there's a lot of interesting stuff that's actually out there for free. Um, so pretty meaningful stuff. Been around for, I don't know, she's been practicing 40 years. Uh, Soil Food Web is a concept that most people have embraced. Um, and uh, to part of our talk that we should get to, it's developing to the point now with this concept of what's called rhizophagy um, by Dr. James White, which in my mind is really just sort of an extension of soil food web because what he's seeing is that these microbes, particularly bacteria and, and well, what they call endophytes um, are entering the plant. Uh, the plant is taking in these microbes and getting a significant nutrient component, particularly they haven't even begun to look at, you know, many of the nutrient components that they're getting, but they have been looking at nitrogen um, and these plants are getting up to 30% of the nitrogen requirement just from these endophytes, um, from the research that he's done. That's pretty powerful, I think. Um, and if we can, you know, source a nitrogen component like that with composts and on-farm inputs and not be reliant on 
a nitrogen component that's extractive and limited, um, uh, that's that's pretty meaningful. And probably providing more nutrition for the plant, which in turn is providing more nutrition for us. It tends to be a plant that is more resistant to pests and disease because it's actually got the full spectrum of nutrition that it needs. Uh, as far as harmful microbes, uh, yeah, a little disclaimer. You certainly, like through some funky brewing processes and maybe some foul composting processes, you can cultivate what would be pathogenic. Um, and you could put, you know, fusarium uh, molds. Uh, you could make, you know, teas and extracts with that. And, you know, you could cover your crop with powdery mildew. Um, which again is why you need a microscope. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, to follow up on that as well, too, uh, in terms of like plants, uh, I know that one family of plants specifically likes of a more uh, bacterial dominated, and those are the brassicas. The family of brassicas typically like a more bacterially dominated soil. Um, and all that means is that brassicas actually are falling within the lower range of the succession that John just explained. Uh, but most of other crops that uh, most farmers uh, go for um, will thrive in more of that one-to-one -one ratio. <laughs> so we know more about Mars than we do about the soil microbiome. Um, so there's a lot of room for growth here. And I, I, my experience uh, with doing this work has been that uh, bringing diversity and kind of having a bit of a buckshot approach to this. And as long as I know that I'm working with microbes that are beneficial and getting them into growing systems and just trying to build that diversity, the seasonal diversity, as well as uh, diversity within the community of microbes and plants, you're building soil health and you're allowing that plant to be in a situation where it can handle different pressures because it's got a functioning community now um, that, you know, we're not going to understand where, where these relationships between microbes are way beyond our comprehension, I think. Um, so, you know, we're not going to get it all, uh, but, but working with what we do know, figuring out how can this be applied in a real working situation that's beneficial, looking at your plant responses, using your microscope as a tool to connect with this, just like anybody that's, I mean, if you're uh, uh, studying squirrels, you know, you're out there looking at squirrels, watching for squirrels, spending a lot of time viewing, observing, and the microscope allows us to do that. And then if we have forums where we can actually, you know, exchange ideas, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a layman's space, um, I think there's a lot to, lot to learn there. Um, the other part that we use microscopes for quite a bit, besides just assessing your compost and maybe your composting techniques and seeing what organisms are coming out of those composting techniques, and once you have that compost, making it into a liquid form by brewing it and making a compost tea or a compost extract, uh, I think is one of the kind of almost critical parts about having a microscope. Because um, in that process, so the, maybe you all know this, but so the difference between an extract and a tea, in an extract, we're just gonna take compost and we're gonna put it into solution. Simple agitation, we're getting some of those microbes off of the compost and into the water. We're not uh, having any reproduction. We're just trying to get some of them off of the compost into a liquid form that makes it a lot easier to apply. Because a you know, handful of compost is only gonna cover so much surface area. But if I take that handful of compost and put it into a five gallon bucket and agitate it and water a whole row, I've now spread some microbes out and gotten them into my soil. And hopefully they take 
and start populating in these spaces. When I take that same compost and put it into a brewer, I'm looking to reproduce these organisms. I wanna see growth. I wanna see multiplication. In those kinds of situations, we tend to be putting in a lot of air because we don't, in a, from a soil food web perspective, we don't want it to become anaerobic. Come on in. <laughs> um, so we're gonna provide a lot of oxygen and we may or may not be putting in different food sources, things like molasses or fish hydrolysates typically, or kelp. Those are like the three most common additives that would go into a, a brewer. And then a lot of air. And a lot of people are doing these things and not necessarily monitoring. And at that point, you're, you're, you're kind of guessing. And But with the microscope, you can see different populations expand. And then another population all of a sudden emerge because your bacteria population has gotten to a point that the protozoa that are in there know that they have a meaningful food source. And then all of a sudden they come out of dormancy and start consuming the bacteria. Now at that point, uh, I know I'm ready to apply because all my protozoa just woke up. And now we've got what they call nutrient cycling going on because we've got a multitude of, of uh, soil food web, different tiers of organisms that are consuming each other and providing nutrition to my plant. So now I'm ready to apply. If I wait too long, some of these things are gonna crash. Um, that biological community might get so big in that brewer, even though I'm dumping in a mass amount of air, they're gonna consume all that air. They can have, they have the potential to consume all that air. And then things are gonna go anaerobic on me and everything that I just brewed for 24 hours is now becoming an anaerobic solution. And I think we could have a conversation about whether it's really good or bad, um, but from the perspective that I'm coming from, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make aerobic organisms that are gonna help me with nutrient cycling. So now I know I can get out there and apply this. <clears throat> that changes. If I do the same brew in July as I did in uh, May, that might be a different time frame. My water temperature is different. I use well water. I, you know, there's differences in my well water. Um, certainly, you know, temperature is a big part. My inputs, it's the same pile of compost, but it's it's dynamic as well. It's it's changing. It's moving. Uh, my food sources might be a little different. So to say cut and dry, you know, I'm going to make a compost tea and it's going to be a 24 brew and I can apply this. I don't believe that's true. I think you need the microscope to really monitor that and let the microbes tell you when it's ready. Because I saw that explosion of a community that I, that I, I know is, is beneficial. Um, and just to put this in perspective, uh, bacteria in particular can actually replicate in about 20 minutes time. So if you actually have a brew, uh, like John was explaining, uh, for 24 hours, that bacteria population is actually gonna increase tremendously. And so uh, having that micro microscope is instrumental to guide you as to what you're gonna be doing. Um, again, you know, you could be completely guessing and when somebody gives you a recipe to follow, there's no such thing. Uh, this is not like baking bread where you know you're going to get the same exact bread if you put these ingredients and you measure them properly. And well, I, I think it is like baking bread, though, Ruben, because that same recipe that your grandmother probably did yeah. and was delicious, and if I take it, it's going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> to, well, to that point, right. So, uh, but how do you know whether or not you're actually getting what well, my grandmother baked? You, you need that microscope. You need that microscope. So, Ruben, I think one of the conditions you know, farmers have to put all of these hats on. Everything is kind of uh, organic and that you're adapting as things happen around you. But if you're investing in the microscope processing uh, procedure, you have to put on this other hat. And then you are have to have some sort of consistency so you can compare, right? But can you go into how technically you should stay consistent or does that 
Is that kind of loose, like your grandmother's recipe will be the same in this kitchen versus your kitchen? Is, is it that lab sensitive or can, can it have these variables? Can, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, I just one? wanted to uh, repeat oh, that. Yes, yep, yep. Uh, the question was do you need to remain consistent from one recipe to another? Uh, whether that's mm -hmm. an individual from one individual to another. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, and from your tech, from my, for, for the microscopy piece, do, are you saying to be consistent overall? And, overall. Well, I, I'd, I'd say what you really need to be consistent with is looking at it under the microscope. Okay. The rest of it, all of those inputs are, there's a degree of variability in there that you're not going to be able to keep track of, which is why, like, it's super critical. Like the same amount of ounces to vary one ounce. I would ounce. encourage that degree of variability too. Like, like let's 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 not be consistent in the let's like sort of explore maybe on a smaller scale different inputs, but always be monitoring it, and not necessarily because you can take this microscopy piece to a very technical and actually count all the microbes and you know if you're going to do a real biological assessment that's exactly what we're doing we're counting a sample of bacteria we're adding up all these different microbes and we're we're building a biomass based on that do you need to do that every time no but if you have a microscope and you're using it often and you're looking at your teas and your extracts um particularly your teas you're now observing, you've spent time observing these microbes, you're seeing patterns, you're seeing growth, you're being aware of what are your beneficials. Now you've got the tool to, to in a relatively quick time, you know, when I'm making a brew, I'm sampling, uh, especially at the end of it, I'm sampling it every, every 30 minutes, seeing where it's at. And that's quick. I just need a drop, I look at it, What's moving? I can scan that thing in 45 seconds and say, we're ready to go. Uh, so it's not a huge time piece, but it's because I've been doing it for five years and I, you know, I, I'm looking for particular organisms that I know, you know, are giving me the sign to go. Um, I'm seeing the patterns that I'm becoming familiar with and, and had the experience that my plant didn't die after I sprayed it. <laughs> um, you know, so that's the piece. It does take time, you know, but that's the part that you need to be consistent with. Everything else, uh, there's already, there's too many variables built into all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. To, to microanalyze it on that part, I, I don't think it's worth it. I think this is actually where the community comes in. Um, John and I doing this alone, we're never going to get to uh, cohesion where we're actually um, uh, getting a better understanding of what's happening. And so if we have a community doing this work, uh, this is where the, the real work is gonna start. If we have more farmers out there doing this work, uh, more practitioners, whoever is that, whoever's interested in doing this, right? Uh, the more people we have doing this type of work, um, that's where we're gonna actually advance. And for that reason, because you can actually start incorporating some of these variables and say, Hey John, you know, can you actually let's run a dual test here? Can you actually do this X, Y, and Z and see what you get? I'll do this X, Y, and Z, and I'll do this. So if we have a community of everybody doing some things that's slightly different to their own context that they're farming to their own context as well, because if I'm farming somewhere, I, I can be your neighbor actually, mm -hmm. and we can probably have complete different hydrology at our site. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have like a particular microclimate. So there's all these variables. And so to, to, to use a particular um, recipe and believe that that recipe is always going to get the same results, it's, it's, it's not. All right. Very much credit. <laughs> so we actually got to talk to Dr. White in preparing for this, um, which, uh, you know, the, the next level of some of this as far as rhizophagy goes, which um, is this a term that everybody's familiar with or maybe just slightly familiar with? Could you redefine it? So uh, layman's terms, rhizophagy is um, the plant actually, they call it rhizophagy because rhizo is root, phagy is to consume. 
something like that. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the intent there is that the plant is actually eating these microbes. Um, so bacteria is entering the root system and the plant is getting a nutritional component from the bacteria itself. It's not just a mineral component. I think we've really sort of been told, you know, that we need to feed our plant, you know, minerals, nutrient, NPK, and that's what the plant's living on. Turns out, you know, that the plant, just like us, actually we're more microbial than we are human genome. Um, the plant also is, is taking in microbes. And, and getting a nutritional and probably a whole lot of other things that we're not even cognizant of, um, but it is getting a nutritional component from uh, bacteria, well, endo endophytes, bacteria and, and fungi in particular. Um, so a little bit to Ruben's point, I mean, doc Dr. White basically was telling us that, you know, this is what needs to happen. <laughs> People in the farming community, you know, uh, need to be looking at this deeper because from his perspective as a researcher, there's only so much research there. Um, and, and where, you know, this really becomes meaningful is when growers are, are doing it and, and making food that's worth eating again, probably sequestering a lot of carbon. Um, and with, a, yeah, sorry. No. Uh, as growers, what would we look for or what would we see in terms of rise, rise of phase? Like how could we tell that's going on? Or... And that was our question to him. Like, how can we take that and bring it to our community with without buying a $50,000 microscope? And he was pretty confident that, you know, with, with our bright field microscopes and a computer and some dyes, some stains, yeah. Um, and a little bit of guidance so that, you know, we actually establish some type of protocols so that we can all be comparing apples to apples. Um, we would see um, a presence by taking the roots. You have to, unfortunately, you, you would be destroying a plant here in the process, um, but you're actually taking the root, um, dyeing it, and then looking at it under your microscope, probably at the highest magnification that we can get it at. It might be with what's called an oil immersion objective. Um, and then what he did say with the computer, um, the software that comes with our cameras has what's called a white balancing feature. So you might have to adjust that. And then you would see a percentage of that slide that's actually um, you know, colonized with microbes that were in that root here. Um, what I realized by talking to him is it's kind of the difference between a Logan lab test and a SAP analysis test. So our soil food web protocols are really looking at what's happening in the soil, what's happening in our compost, what's happening in these amendments that we're bringing out. This is telling us what's actually getting inside of the plant. So it's like a SAP analysis from a mineral standpoint um, so now, you know, we can assess some functionality and I think it's going to be a really interesting way to like, you know, test our biological inputs, our composts and our extracts. And, you know, we do that. And then if we've got a means to look at that root hair and, you know, what percentage of it turned purple, um, you know, that's going to give us a, a, an index as far as the effectiveness of, of these microbes getting in. And with a guy like Dr. James White giving us feedback as far as, you know, what is the nutrient uptake? Um, we're not going to be able to do that, but we, we can, you know, determine inoculations, which then gives us a feedback loop of our practices. Because all this is going to be hinged on what are we doing with that soil? You know, how much disturbance, whether it's chemical or physical, are on our soils. Um, The other, the other uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll go with you for a second. The other thing about this too is, as far as I understand uh, from the, there's a series of dyes. Uh, it's not just one specific dye that you use, and there's a specific series of dyes that you can use. For example, if you use a dye that's gonna react with nitrogen, you're now 
when you take either a root piece or a trichome from a plant, uh, sometimes the uh, leaves as well, because the, these endophytes, which are basically microorganisms that live inside the plant, um, they're everywhere. They're coming from the air and they're also coming from the soil. Uh, the ones that are inside of the plant are definitely coming from inside of, uh, from the roots, right, uh, as this rhizophagy. So we can actually further this knowledge of saying, okay, I'm going to take my, uh, not, uh, uh, my, uh, my legumes, I'm going to inoculate them. Now, how do I know that these microbes are actually entering these? Or even if it's not a inoculum, let's say they're free living Rhizo, uh, right, rhizobium that are free living and fixed nitrogen, are they actually entering my plant? So you can uh, use a specific dye that's going to react with that nitrogen through some of these plants and then actually say, it's this is happening now. Um, and so to my understanding, you can do this for other components too in the whole NPK range and other micronutrients as well. Uh, so you can then say, um, you know, I have this amount in my soil. Uh, and this is happening, right? This, and, and it doesn't take much. And this is this is where it's going to get really interesting, our efficiency of adding fertilizers. So agronomists, for the longest time, we were trained on ionic exchange. So the plant gets its uh, nutrition through ionic exchange. We all now know it's a biological process. So if we now know it's a biological process, are these microbes that are in your soil or in the air, endophytes now in the plant, are those the ones that you want in there? Are those the ones fixing nitrogen? Are those the ones solubilizing phosphorus? Uh, do I then need to add all of this phosphorus because the plant obviously is going through this rhizophage cycle? So, so that's that's really where um, our understanding of this is going to become tremendous because we can potentially reduce our uh, dependence on certain fertilizers um, and reduce our our our, our the overall uh, the price that you would be paying to add certain inputs. So this actually can actually help with that. I, I, we could be looking at recommendations of minerals that are high because we haven't really factored in this biological efficiency. Right? So if, you know, for whatever, you know, 500 pounds of gypsum, you know, that could be, that's probably based on very inactive biology. So if we pick up that biological piece, maybe we don't need 500 pounds. Maybe we need 50. And the only way that we're going to make money farming is if we increase the price of our stuff or decrease our inputs. And I don't think we're increasing our prices too much because it hasn't happened in a long time. People want the dollar happy meal. And that seems to be a constant in the marketplace. But I think we can reduce our inputs. And I think we can do it with biology. Yeah, and this is becoming a real thing uh, with now the war that's happening in, in Ukraine. Um, a, lot of, some of the, a lot of these inputs are actually coming from overseas. And so I think that um, this war has actually woken up the uh, masses and said, you know, like, what are we doing? Uh, the US, uh, the USDA uh, this past summer put out a grant for um, innovative ways to uh, uh, reduce our, our dependency. Uh, this is the government now recognizing that we have a problem. Um, and so, um, so what are we going to do about that? Um, and this is the community that needs to be built because we can't depend on those processes. Uh, they're not going to come to us. But before I go into any questions, I know you had a question. Yeah. These, uh, these endophytes, did they form obstacles inside the root cells? And when you section or set a piece of root, would you be able to see that like a 400x microscope? So the arboriscules are different from these endophytes. Yeah. Um, the endophytes that we're talking about are um, are uh, particularly uh, mostly bacteria, some yeast. Arboriscules are- uh, They channel inside the root, right? Inside the root cell. 
Right. So, but these are ar arbuscules are different. Arbuscules right. you would find. So there's two ways to evaluate that. Um, you can do a staining process like uh, similar to this, but it uses different stains. Uh, but you have to then, you, it's more destructive too, because you have to clear the root um, with the process um, and then stain it, and then look at it under microscope. You can also use a fluorescent mic microscope and use that to detect those fungal strands because arbuscules are fungi. Michael Reisel. So specific. that's a slightly different category, still very, very meaningful to the plant. But there's certainly been a lot of talk over the last couple of years about mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and, but and see if this stuff is there. And the yes. Is, is that stuff visible with like a typical 400X microscope? I, yes, with, with the staining process. With the staining process. And I've heard different, and I don't have any application in this, but whether you need the fluorescence or not, um, typically, I think the standard protocol is is a dye, and then you have a fluorescent light, um, and then that mag, uh, illuminates the mycorrhizal infection in the root system. Good. That's a little different. It, it, so you're identifying a different organism as opposed to what Dr. White's referring as an endophyte. Um, so two different processes identifying different groups of organisms that are super meaningful to your plant. But we could, uh, you know, with not piles of money, um, but you could have those tools in your house. Yeah. There is a, uh, a staining method that you can use. The, I think SARE, the SARE grant, Sustainable Agriculture and Resources Education, put out a simple method for people to do on farm. Um, and instead of using harsh chemicals, they replace some of those harsh chemicals with a simple vinegar, with a simple uh, ink stain, um, and maybe a few other things like calcium chloride, stuff, stuff to clear the roots, right? Because you have to clear the roots before you actually stain them so they can view them. Um, I'm more than happy to share that with you. Um, that's a very simple thing and something that we can continue to develop if there's a need for that, if there's an interest for that. What you can do with a simple bright field microscope in your compost, you can identify mycorrhizal spores. Um, so at least you're under the impression that we're inoculating our gardens with mycorrhizal fungi because I'm seeing you know, a presence of mycorrhizal spores. When we talk about looking at the compost, are you talking about the compost solution or actually solid material? Solid material. So when I sample compost, we're gonna, I'm gonna take a, if I got a pile, I'm gonna, depending on how big the pile is, I'm gonna take a sampling, try to get a representative of that pile, mix it up in a bucket, and then I'm gonna end up taking either a milliliter or two, putting it in a test tube, agitating it, and taking one drop out of that, and putting it on a slide and then looking at it under my bright field microscope. And that's the you know simple soil food web process. And then we're gonna scan that um, and use that, you know, as my uh, as my criteria to assess that 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 pile of compost. Yep. And in so that whole process, if there are mycorrhizal spores, I'll be able to see them. So you're always looking at a solution. You're looking at a solution. Yeah, we've dropped it. So that's where like, so if you had a dissecting microscope, um, you could, with that scope, a lot of the times you're looking at dry media and I don't have one, so I should be a little careful talking about it. But most of those folks are, you know, putting a sample, the light source is usually coming down from the top. So you're just illuminating a surface and looking at it with a microscope. Um, some of them have a light on the bottom, so you can do both. Uh, but you tend to be looking at more like, you know, macro arthropods, insects, leaf surfaces, um, you know, when you really want to see, you know, magnifying features. It's, it's kind of a glorified magnifying glass. Um, but, you know, if that's all you had, I, you could assess compost with it. And at least you're, you know, you're seeing, te there's another part of this whole thing is like just the texture looking at it, you know, microscopically, you're getting some feedback, you know, how many 
it, do I have soil aggregation? Do I have that sponginess? Um, can I see, you can see the different colors of uh, what would be humic components and fulvic components. You know, you can see those colors. So you can see these patterns. Um, and again, just get a little bit more observant with whatever the resource is that you're trying to use. And we are you using like distilled water for your- uh, No, 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 no. Well water, what you don't want to use is chlorinated treated water because that's going to obviously knock back some of the microbes that, and again, we're looking for active microbes. So we want to see movement. We don't want to hit them with a bunch of chlorine. Um, so well water, uh, if, you, if you have municipal tap water, you can do some things to just volatize that chlorine, um, depending on whether they're using chlorine, uh, chlorine, chlorine, or chlorine. Yeah, you know. Sure. Um, so as far as like inputs uh, that you might need to do your own, you know, couple of test tubes, couple of pipettes, some slides, cover slip, water, bright field microscope. And actually I do have a cut sheet um, of like what type of microscope, for those of you that don't have microscopes, um, you know, just what like soil food web recommendation is just to do some of this, this uh, simple stuff, which again, I, I guess we could talk a little bit about that, you know, like, you know, what can NOFA Mass do going forward? Um, you know, if, if that's something meaningful, you know, we had a question here first. Yeah, sorry. Well, you kind of answered it. I, I wondered what the USDA is thinking about all this when they're so heavily dependent upon the oil industry for all their research and funding. You'd have to ask Mr. Vilsack. I want to add a quick answer here. In our state, we have a, a law that promotes biological uh, methods. In Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. I don't think any other state has it. It's MGL 132B, section 5A. Oh, MGL 132B, 5A? 5A. Okay, that's how they, they like to yeah. okay. I think going forward, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be looking at, you know, this biological workforce, um, particularly with my point that I made earlier that I, I think that there's a significant reason that, or, you know, uh, way, you know, that we can reduce our inputs as growers. Um, and source, you know, plant nutrition from the farm. And that's going to be a biological method. Uh, whether you read like the uh, Korean natural farming practices, um, uh, the effect of microorganisms, the soil food web, uh, biodynamics, um, uh, uh, permaculture folks, you know, all those circular economies that they're building within their farm systems are, are it's all a biological system. Um, and there's, you know, some case studies now, not case studies, but, you know, real proof of concept that, you know, they're, they're growing healthy plants that don't require, uh, you know, pesticides and herbicides and, um, you know, reducing their, their, carbon footprint in this process um, and making food that's actually worth eating again. It has real nutrition. We, we did it this year. I mean, we did it. I mean, we, we put our income on, on the line. So it's three years of uh, low-till organic farming. And uh, this is our first year. We didn't use, uh, we didn't invest in compost. We died. I mean, just, we only went with compost tea. We had our best year. Where's your farm? It's in half the big bulk of soil. I don't know why it's in the farm. It's mean, full of rocks. But it took, took a long time to get it up. But uh, I'm not going to say that after seven years, but they have all those other barriers. It's like, but like that efficiency piece right there, as opposed to buying however many yards of compost. And now, if you know that the biomass in the compost is at a level 
then I can extract those microbes and put them into solution. And I don't need a dump truck full of compost. I only need a five gallon bucket. When I make a hundred gallons of compost tea, I use about eight pounds of compost. And I put that into a hundred gallons of material and I can spray that on an acre. Eight, eight pounds of compost. That's kind of efficient in my book. Yeah, so the, the thing about compost is like, well, how do you view your compost, right? Are you viewing your compost as adding organic matter to your soil or are you using your compost as a biological inoculum? Because if you're using it as a biological ino inoculum, there's different ways to do that. That will be through a tea, that would be through an extract. Now, we now know that uh, increasing organic matter it's the most efficient way to increase organic matter on your soil is by using cover crops or live roots. They're the best way of getting carbon into the ground. Um, unfortunately, compost only adds, adds less than 1% of organic matter per year on your soil. And this is, and we're talking about the best compost out there. You know? So um, that's where you have to weigh out your, your uh, your, your compost and how you can actually have a small amount of compost go a long way. And that's looking at it as inoculum and not a way to do so. We've got a question in Zoom land. Did you, did they want to? There she is. On my yeah. video. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Hi. Um, I had a question. I just, first of all, this is amazing and so fascinating. And I have so many questions, but I'm going to try and limit it to just one. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Ruben, I think you came out to my farm, the Needham Community Farm this summer. We do a lot of, uh, or this spring, you dropped off some plants. We do a lot of um, farm-based education. Um, and I'm curious, and I think we had a little conversation then about some like education work you were starting. Um, and I'm just curious about like, how how to make this like incorporate this into like farm based education um and also my farm doesn't have electricity so <laughs> um, like i have i have i have a small microscope that's very low power that doesn't require electricity of my own um but i'm just wondering if you can talk about yeah farm based education and incorporating microscopes into that as well yeah so in terms of uh your microscope there are options um uh, there are options that use uh, either a battery powered microscope, so that's an option to use. Um, and for the most part, these microscopes are actually, uh, at least the newer ones, use LEDs. LEDs don't draw much energy, and so that's another option there too. Um, I've been looking into that too because um, that's one of the barriers that I have been seeing uh, while going to farms um, is access to power. And so I've been looking into small battery packs and trying to reduce um, my uh, uh, my load, and uh, meaning, uh, you know, getting an LED microscope, uh, having a smaller screen perhaps, or not having a screen and having people just use that LED microscope that just requires a small draw. Um, so so it is possible uh, you can get a battery pack. Um, and if you're just powering the microscope, uh, that could easily be done. The issue comes if you're actually in a large group and you're trying to show uh, uh, on a screen, uh, you know, that, that's where the, uh, the drawback is. Um, but there, is or there are ways to do that. Um, and in terms of the education, um, we're hoping to hear from you guys, actually. Um, we want to hear from, from uh, the community as to, you know, John and I are in a bubble. We're in a bubble, we're like, yeah, hey, microscopes. Um, but um, that may not be the, 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 the community, right? And we, we need to find out if there's, we see the value in it. Uh, we hope that others can see the value in it as well. We're hoping we're not crazy. <laughs> well, we know we're crazy. But... <laughs> <laughs> we're not crazy to be so angry. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, you know, so, so we're relying on the community to actually give us feedback on, on these things. So, um, you know, um, super easy to reach, uh, Ruben at nofamass.com. Uh, if you go onto our website, all of our information's on there too. 
uh, but we need to hear from folks to see if uh, this is a real uh, a real need. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Us in the, in the direction of resources that we can we can go to to educate ourselves. Yes, uh, John actually put out a super great list of resources, um, which we will uh, upload to Hoover. Um, but we can also email you directly. Yeah, I'm happy. I got my clipboard. If on you guys way out, um, and y'all in Zoom land, if you wanna, you know, share your email address, um, I can take it. And I'm happy to. It just this was a cut sheet of like stuff that, you know, I've learned a lot from books, uh, websites, um, you know, those kinds of resources. Um, I should have put the cut sheet on as far as like uh, what type of microscope, you know, for soil food web applications, what are, there's some terms there that, you know, like a, what's an ape condenser, no, you know, those kinds of terms as far as like if you're looking for a microscope or, um, you know, what should it actually have? Because there's, there's a lot of different kinds of microscopes out there, uh, but that kind of information I can get you. So I'll leave the clipboard and y'all can write it down. Um, if you all want to, do we have a chat on this thing or? There's only two people out there. If, if you want me to have your email address, I'll I'll write it down. Okay, and, um, I, I did put it in us. chat, but I don't know if it went through. <laughs> I don't know. I'm an idiot. So <laughs> let me see if I can find the. I can I can tell you after. Oh wait, here it is, right here. Let me see. I figured. I figured it out. I got it. Did you say the microscopes are set up? the student center third floor so right where you registered um so there's a there's two doors when you go into the registration um the very first uh set of doors take a left there's an elevator there on the third floor and it's going to be on your uh immediate left cool. i encourage you all to go up there um you can drive the microscope see how you can prepare a sample so probably go into more detail as to how to do this instead of the theory that we just uh, went through that's going to be set up throughout the day yes yeah, John and I will be John and I will be hosting um, some other sessions, uh, but we hope to be there during lunch. But there's somebody up there that's a certified um, through soil food web that can guide you through that. Melissa, and then there's another sort of student microscope woman named Agnes. Um, but but yeah, they should be up there working the microscope, and they're kind of friendly. <laughs> but not too friendly. Not too friendly. These online uh, classes through the Soil Food Network. You take the class online at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, how do you learn to use the microscope? So, the foundation classes, which there's a lot of, um, is really just you going through at a self paced. Like, there you go. Uh, yeah, a lot of videos, a lot of Dr. Ingham speaking um, slides, concepts, very much more soil food web concept and theory. Like, what are the groups of organisms? What are they doing? Um, problems with ag. Uh, all the way down. <laughs> when you move on, when you get through all that, if you wanted to then become a soil lab tech, then you enroll in that course. Thank you very much. Thank you. And at that point, you get assigned a mentor. You need a microscope. You need a computer. You need a camera. And you start doing um, basically a Zoom learning one-to-one -one with a mentor. So she'll give you work to do for the week. You meet basically once a week. Uh, there's more testing. And actually, to get into that program, you need to do all the foundation work, you need to take all the tests, and you need to have a 90% average in order to even be enrolled into the... Um, so while you're, if you're doing the foundation work, um, don't screw up the tests. Yeah. Because if you decide, geez, I want you had to have a 90% average to get in there. And there's a lot of tests, and some of it's actually challenging, mostly because some of the questions are really poorly written, but they might have gotten better. Uh, but it's... it's <laughs> It's a lot of information. Um, it helped me out a lot. Um, you know, and then, so if you wanna become a soil tech, then you're gonna learn this whole process of, of counting microbes uh, to 
you know, I guess qualitatively assign a biomass to a soil component. I will say that there are other tools out there, uh, one of which is sponsoring and has a table. The microbiometer is here today. And um, so that's a test um, that's going to give you a meaningful biological index as well without going through this. There's some areas that it doesn't address, um, but I think it's a pretty darn good tool um, and can certainly be implemented into a farm system as well. So does MOFA take samples from the public and like tell them fungal bacteria ratios? Yeah, this is certainly a service that we offer. Um, so um, there's actually a QR code here that gives you um, specifics on the our services. So we offer three major services, one being the chemical analysis, which is a local lab report where you would collect your samples, send it out to the lab. We take a sample uh, and evaluate your uh, results uh, and provide your recommendations. Uh, another one that we do have as well is the soil health assessment, which we go to your field, um, We'll walk around, get some history of the field, um, and do more of the physical characteristics, such as water filtration, penetrometer readings, um, uh, bulk density, uh, looking at the physical aggregation as well, which is very important. Um, also, another way of looking at it through microscope, too, right? So you can look at it with your eyes to see if you're actually seeing that aggregation and what type of aggregation. Um, and then finally, the microscope assessment. So you can actually send in a, a, a soil sample. Um, we're focusing on soil samples only because when you start to look at uh, liquid samples, those that you have actually extracted through, uh, uh, through your compost, if you if you put that in a container and mail it to me, by the time I get it, well, it's not necessarily actually. It's probably going to be very, very, very alive, but not the same stuff that you heard. Um, you know, it's the same thing that John was saying, uh, the, the classic prey um, predator interactions, whenever you have food, the prey will increase um, and so on. And you can see that flow. So if you close that jar, you send it to me, you reduce the amount of oxygen. Um, now the organisms that wake up are different from the ones that you actually were giving air to. So, um, so we're focusing more on soil and compost for that reason. Um, so you can send it in, uh, we'll give you a full report. Um, the report basically gives you uh, biomass of bacteria, biomass of fungi, biomass um, uh, ratio of these two. Um, and it also looks at other organisms such as detrimental organisms that may be like, uh, uh, we also scan for nematodes and we'll tell you what type of nematodes you have. Um, and then uh, notes on our, uh, microarthropods, if you have any, and protozoa, what kind of protozoa do you have? So there's three major protozoa uh, families. There's the uh, amoeba, flagellates, and um, cilia. So we'll tell you which ones you have and what range you want to be. Uh, and everything will provide you with the range, like, you know, you're here and you want to be here. So. What does that mean? Um, that is 125, I believe. And how do we contact? Uh, you can go out to our website, um, and uh, there's a link on our uh, website. No, what, to what, no, what? Yep, you can use noflamass.org. Uh, and uh, there's a landing page for all of our services there. Uh, we also do consults as well, and all that information is on there as well. So, just to read a uh, class. To your question, but we can go to the third floor and uh, that would be during the whole day. Yeah, yeah, all, all day. Uh, somebody will somebody will be there all day. Um, there's uh, we have the microbiometer kit up there as well. Uh, we're looking at soil samples as well. So if anybody has any soil samples that they brought in, uh, Logan Lab report, Logan Lab assessment as well. Um, and uh, soil health proxy. And somebody else will be there to talk about the uh, soil assessment as well. You can meet Jane Hammer, Lord Davis, Melissa, Agnes, probably Agnes. Agnes. And I believe uh, we'll also have another member of our board, uh, Bianchi Marisma, which has 
shared some of our spaces too when we're going out to the youth. Um, and he specializes in Korean national farming. So he'll also be up there at, at some point. So Jason to the farmer, the the, the, the farmer to farmer consult is in the other room. So I don't know if you saw any of the, it, right next to the farmer to farmer consult up on the third floor of the uh, student service. Center. Um, all right. So just to wrap up, thank you all. I hope this was helpful. Sure. Definitely feel free to reach out. It'd be really cool to build this community. And you know, if you got ideas, email us. Keep us working. Um, uh, don't forget to check out the auction and everything. Oh, and then evaluation. Um, I don't know exactly where this document is, but uh, we do appreciate your feedback. Um, and there is a way to evaluate all these workshops. I'm just not exactly sure where it is.